going to happen if the sea level rises. As I told you at the beginning, uh, increasing temperature means increasing sea level. Uh, I should emphasize, the sea level will, will go up independently of whether the, all the glaciers and all that melt. There's two separate factors here. First of all, if you've got a glacier, if you've got, uh, let's say, like uh, the, um, the ice fields of, a, of, the, of the, <coughs> the polar ice fields, if they all melt, that isn't going to do anything to sea level because that ice is floating in water to start with. On the other hand, ice that's on land, like, say, the Greenland ice cap or Antarctica, if that stuff melts and runs into the sea, then you have significant uh, sea level rises. But the point I'm trying to make is that you have sea level rises irrespective of the ice just because of the changing density of the hot, warmer water. So sea levels are going to go up, and people who live by the sea levels, who live by the sea, are going to be in trouble. Will One of the, the little... Lake? What? Will this affect the Great Lakes? Sure. So, and how would it? Is it a Same way. Same way? Yeah. Um, one of the little island republics off of Africa, west of Africa, uh, they're so worried that uh, it was a publicity stunt. The, governor, the government, the president, had a cabinet meeting. They got the whole cabinet in, into scuba suits, and they had their meeting underwater. Uh, purely publicity, but uh, very suggestive. Um, <clears throat> so now there's the question. So we might have to move. Huh? We might have to move. Uh, we are. 500 or I forget the, sea, the level of Detroit. But we're about 500, 700 feet above sea level. We're let the other guys worry. We don't have to worry. <laughs> so now the question is, what's to be done? I have a few minutes left. One. Um, we could. I. I. I in, in my order. A limit the population which is causing climate change and at the same time so, so the population is not only causing the climate change by producing all the CO2 but the crowding of the population increases the susceptibility to the damage which will result from climate change so anybody who really attempts to deal with, with this thing looking toward the future and ignores population uh, is is a fool. Population is an important, a major question for the future. B, clean up the current emissions of greenhouse gases, dusts, and aerosols. I should point out, the, the carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas. It's carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane. But the point is we have control over the carbon dioxide. We don't have control over the others and the others fluctuate greatly. So clean it up. Uh, capture the CO2, perhaps. Store it underground. There's all sorts of talk about it. It's all very, very expensive. C, somehow or other change societal behavior. Either put carbon caps on, carbon taxes, shift from coal to natural gas, shift to nuclear. Uh, change from individual homes and transportation to communal homes, apartment houses, uh, public transportation. All of that will cut down on the emissions of carbon dioxide. But all of that requires change of behavior. And we all know that people don't like to change their behavior. Um, although our under, I call it the underdog population, so far at least, as I view the present day political climate, they show very little inclination to challenge the top dogs. Um, most observers don't think that a blatant adoption of, of, of option A will fly. That is, uh, limit the population. That ain't going to go. Not by itself, anyhow. Uh, of course, one implication of A is somehow or other, no matter what happens badly, the top dogs will come out all right. 
The top dogs will have their mountain homes as well as their seaside homes, so they'll give off this. They'll give up their seaside home. Uh, that's the history of the world. Top dogs always come out all right. So the top dogs could say, "Well, yeah, let's not do anything. We'll be all. I'll, I'll be all right, Jack." Uh, the trouble, of course, is so far at least. Uh, there's very little challenge of the top dogs, but it's unlikely that the bottom dogs will, will, will accept a blatant uh, adoption of let's do nothing and don't worry about it. Um, <clears throat> so the money, as far as I can see, is, is on option B. Clean up the current stuff, capture CO2, store it underground. Um, there's a lot of money available for that. Uh, there's um, certainly a lot of money available for advertising of that. You might be interested in comparing the amount of dollars spent by British Petroleum on advertising for its good boy image with the amount of dollars they spend on research on uh, surf safe drilling, for example. I suspect, I don't have the numbers, I suspect you'll find many more dollars for the first than the second. Um, the fact remains money is very important here. Uh, in 2006, California passed a bipartisan bill, Assembly Bill uh, 32, calling for the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So in 2006, that bill passed both houses bipartisanly. Now, in 2010, there is a ballot item on the current election called Proposition 23 to suspend the bill. And who's supporting uh, all the efforts on Proposition 23? It's supported by megabucks, most of it from out of state and most of it from oil companies. The Chamber of Commerce, many Republicans are supporting uh, Proposition 23. They claim that uh, the um, the original assembly bill is going to is going to uh, be a potential job loss, even though all the facts indicate just the opposite. That is, when you start pollution controlling and all that, you have to pay people to do it. There's jobs. Um, but as I understand, the latest polls in California is very iffy as to whether Proposition uh, 23 will pass. In other words, in four years, it's gone from complete support to very iffy. Do you and know what that cost is? I can't get that. Is it advertising? <coughs> Money. Advertising. Money. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, the airwaves are saturated with uh, opponents of, uh, of Assembly Bill 32, which I have to emphasize was a bipartisan issue back in four years ago. And now it's completely partisan, and uh, you see the difference. Well, I've gone over my time. I'm sorry. I really wanted to discuss the politics more, but perhaps we can discuss that in a few minutes remaining. Please. I really enjoyed the talk, Dr. I took a class with you years ago, but I enjoyed this talk. Um, when you, when you discuss the, you, you clearly show the science of this, the science of global warming is there. You, you make the argument. I mean, we made the argument about evolution too. The science of it is there, but you know, you got this questioning of it. I think when Galileo, when Copernicus, when they found their discoveries, their scientific discoveries, they were called heretics by the religious community. And today we find, um, not just religious right, but 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 like I said, this conservative element in, in the fossil fuel industry, people make profit off of that. They're strongly fighting <coughs> science and dismissing the science of it all. Uh, and, and that makes it a real uphill battle. Uh, because we make so much money, so much wealth can produce off of that, that fossil fuel industry, uh, we become myopic in the way that we, 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 we establish policy. You got China, you got Japan, and other parts of the world that are really moving ahead with this green energy movement. And we're still you know, making these types of arguments because of uh, sort of the politics of it. I want to get your, your thoughts on that. Well, I should have spent, I, I just want to say a few things at the beginning, <coughs> but I should have said more. As far as I'm concerned, it all comes down to whose ox gets gored, or who pays for, for the changes.